All right. Good evening, um, and welcome to our latest uh, Grand Court webinar on transitional feeding for stock. Um, my name is Glenn McFarland. I'm a technical support manager for Grand Court here in the Waikato. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker for tonight, um, I'd just like to thank you all for attending not only this webinar, but also the other ones that we've uh, had. Um, and due to your responses, we're actually going to continue to have these as a bit of a series, and they are all available on our Grain Corp um, Facebook page. So if you ever want to go back and see one, um, then you're more than welcome to go ahead and then get back to us on any um, questions that you still may have on any one of the past ones. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we're going through tonight. Um, there's the Q&A function down the bottom, which you can find. Um, you ask them at any point in time, and I'll be able to throw that on to our guest speaker to hopefully answer the questions as best as you possibly can. Um, and I guess now I would like to introduce Nadine Olson. Um, she's a nutritionist from um, Utatec. Uh, I would also like to just thank as well, um, oh, sorry, um, congratulate her on a achieving um, passing her Australian Association of Ruminant Nutritionists exam. So congratulations to you, Nadine. That sounds like it was a lot of work. Um, and yeah, hopefully yeah, it all pays off for you. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks. All right, you're ready for me to start, is that right? Yes, please. Excellent. So yeah, as Glenn has said, thank you all very much for joining on tonight. Um, the topic for this evening is, um, is transition, but sometimes we get a bit mixed up with transitioning on and off crops. So just to clarify, we're talking about transitioning springer cows this evening and how we can take them through uh, as springers to becoming um, high performing uh, lactating dairy cows. So that's what we're going to cover. As Glenn has said, please feel free to ask questions. Um, where possible, I will try to answer them in the relevant section. Um, but otherwise, we will come to those at the end as well with some time for with some time for Q and A. So, without further ado, just get things moving. So, the first thing I wanted to go through just briefly was uh, what is milk fever costing us as as farmers? And and I think this is probably one of the most underestimated areas in terms of um, financial impacts as far as cow health and disease goes, because the the reality is is Often we just consider the cost of treatment. So whether that's a, you know, a bag of metabolics or maybe a little bit of labor and tractor time to deal with down cows. But often farmers will tell me that the cost of treatment for them is around about $40 to $80 a cow. And what I want to highlight tonight is that that's not where the cost stops. And the number is actually much greater than that. So the first part of this understanding this milk fever cost is how much milk does a clinical cow lose? So when I say clinical cow, what I'm talking there is a cow that you've that is showing clinical signs or obvious signs of being a down cow, a milk fever cow, um, and, and you've had to treat her, basically. So you've, you've had to give her some treatment to get her to stand back up again. Uh, it also includes those cows that are, that are just a little bit wobbly and you're going to give them something because you can see what's coming in advance. And some work by Dairy and Z showed that cows, cows that you treat for milk fever lose two litres per day every single day of lactation following being a, a milk fever cow or hypocalcemic cow. So if I do a little bit of maths, two litres, 280 days, eight and a half solids, obviously we're making assumptions all the way through here, but we're actually talking around $450, $460 worth of lost milk from that cow that you've had to treat. Um, but the, the other and probably the bigger number is what we call subclinicals. So these are cows that you haven't had to treat. You haven't spotted in the herd as being low in blood calcium, but they are low in calcium. And what we know from that same Steria and Z study was that those cows, um, there's 10 to 15 of them for every cow that we've actually treated. And those cows lose a litre a day. So if we went somewhere in the middle at 12 cows times a liter a day, that's nearly up to you know, 2728 as far as a cost of those subclinical cows that have been affected by low blood calcium or hypocalcemia. So you can see now that every cow that you're out there treating, and it's an awful job and it's not nice, and I know you're all trying to do your best to prevent milk fever, but it's not the 40 or $80 dollars of that treatment um, that you're administering as far as the cost. Every cow that you're jabbing or having to help stand back up again is costing you over three grand now at a $9.60 milk payout. So it's a much bigger number. And then if we want to add deaths to that, then 
if we're just looking at the milk production alone from one season that she hasn't been able to make it through, you're talking another $4,300. So it is a big number and it's definitely worthwhile looking at how we can prevent milk fever and it is preventable um, rather than just trying to deal with treating, treating milk fever cows. Uh, and I will get to some good news shortly, but I do need to highlight that milk fever, you know, that was sort of the milk production loss side of milk fever. But when you've got a cow that uh, is hypocalcemic or low in blood calcium, she's down and she's on the ground and you need to help her get back up again because she can't contract a smooth muscle. She physically cannot contract the muscle and stand. And the problem is that there's lots of smooth muscles throughout the animal and some of them, you know, we don't see quite so clearly, for example, the rumen, that needs to contract and move feed. And if, you're got, if you've got cows with low blood calcium, they can't contract and move feed very well, so their intake drops. Uh, and then we get those flow on conditions that you all know too well when you've got a cow with milk fever, she'll often be the one that also gets ketosis, has issues with her liver, and then we get flow and effects to milk yield and repro and those types of things. But the other part of rumen contractions that we've probably underestimated, and I need to draw another line on this picture here, is that if the rumen isn't contracting well, it's not able to move the acid that comes from the breakdown of feed to the rumen wall. So what you have is a two-way street with milk fever and acidosis or subacute rumen acidosis, SARA as we'd call it, mostly in New Zealand, because you end up with a risk of milk fever cows getting acidosis because they can't get the acid to the rumen wall. The rumen's not contracting very well. Uh, and so that risk goes up, but equally you can get it the other way around as well where the acidosis can actually contribute to milk fever because we start to interfere with magnesium getting to the wall and sodium and other interactions that are happening when that rumen pH changes. So you know, there's the physical down cow, but there's also the fact that her rumen isn't working very well either. The other big part of smooth muscle function is the uterus. And there's a, uh, a very important job, which is to eject the placenta. And we see this time and time again, no matter which study we look at, cows with milk fever, either clinical or subclinical, do have a greater risk of retained fetal membranes. And they, can't, and they do have a risk of more difficult carvings because they can't physically contract and push the calf out. They also can't physically contract and push the, the fetal membrane or the, the placenta out. So as you all know, you then get a risk of um, uterine infections and the uterus doesn't recover very well, which is where we get one of those links to reproduction because she's had, she's had a hard time dealing, um, dealing with getting rid of that, that um, placenta. And then the last place that we have a really important smooth muscle contraction is the teat sphincter. So that's the piece at the end of the teat that basically opens and shuts. And if she can't shut that teat sphincter very well or at all, then it's very, very open to environmental pathogens getting up into that teat canal. So this is where we get greater risk of mastitis and you know, higher somatic cell count from cows that have been either clinically or subclinically hypocalcemic. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is we've got those financial numbers, you know, the $3,200 for every cow we treat for milk fever. That's only the milk production side. That's not factoring in all of these other flow and effects. So you can see how the majority of your animal health costs and consequences happen as a result of transition or, or spring cow management and, and milk fever. So certainly something worthwhile working on over the next few months to try and reduce as much as possible. Uh, the other link to reproduction, and, and I think we see this often with um, herds that are struggling on, on the repro side of things, and often this is herds that may still cycle well, but not necessarily hold the pregnancies very well. So a lot of returns coming back, either early, short returns or long returns. Largely, it's the long returns. And what we know and what this picture is showing, so along the bottom here is days postpartum or days after carbon. So day zero here is the day that she's carved. And these are the different ovulations that are happening. So every 21 days, um, there's, there's an egg released. So what the star is, is that egg being released every 21 days. Um, so if we're looking at mating cows, say 80, 90, 100 days post calving, then the what we call maturation or the maturing of that egg is actually happening over the 100 days prior. So 
these eggs here that you're trying to inseminate at day 90, day 100, are actually really subject to what's happening as Springer cows and what's happening in that early lactation period as far as cow health and immune function and uterine health and all those things go um, because, because of that, I guess, that cycle of, of maturing before they're released every 21 days. So not only have we got the uterus and the uterine contraction and metritis, we've got this egg and follicle quality story as well, which we're starting to learn a bit more about, um, which is probably a different talk when it comes to repro. So when we're looking at fixing milk fever, I'd love to say there's a silver bullet, but there's not because the reality is, is that it's quite a complex disease. And I sort of work on 12 milk fever checks. And, and what this is to say is that if, if someone comes in and says this one thing, if, if you fix your mag, you're going to fix all your problems, or if you feed this, you're going to fix all your problems. You're not taking into account the fact that there's a lot of different things that can contribute. And each of you out there will have a different uh, situation on farm in terms of your dry cows and your springer cows and your colostrums and your milkers. You've got different feeds, different challenges, and this season has certainly been challenging for a lot of you for a lot of reasons. So it's important that we go through all of these, and some will apply to you more than others. But we need to we need to know that there's no there's no one quick fix. So the first thing which I'm sure you're all aware of is this body condition score. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, other than to say this is a little bit like the Goldilocks um, story where we need cows to be calving in that four and a half to five in that just right zone, or heifers in the five to five and a half, because we end up with troubles if we get cows too fat pre-calving, and we end up with troubles if we get cows too thin pre-calving. So at the too fat end of the spectrum, they have significantly reduced dry matter intake because it starts to interfere with insulin and the whole hormonal side of um, feed intake. And when you have cows that don't eat well, they don't eat what we think we're offering. And they, um, and then they obviously get at a greater risk of ketosis and a lot of those flow on conditions that can come from milk fever as well. So it's largely the fact that uh, larger cows or overweight cows don't eat very well and they lose a lot of weight post-calving. On the two light ends, they, they don't have enough energy basically to carve or energy reserves to carve. And this is where they have a long and prolonged carving. And, and we can start to see milk fever issues arise as well. Now, I know this is all very well and good to say on paper. In reality, it's really challenging. And I, I get that at a herd level, and especially large herds. It can be hard to get this right. But the really good thing about Grain Corp and timing this presentation when they have is that now is the time to, what I say, tighten up the range. So if you've got cows that are starting to get too heavy or are likely to be over body condition score five and a half at carving, then we need to start managing how we're feeding those cows now so that the fats don't get any fatter and that we can try and bring the lights up into this middle range or to a place where they're going to reach that four and a half um, by carving. And, and that will depend on your wintering programs and how that all works. But We've really only got sort of that six weeks or so to be able to do this. So now is the time to be preferentially feeding or whatever the strategy is to, to bring up these lighter cows in particular and try and maintain and stop the weight gain on some of these heavier cows, which is basically what I've just said there. Late lactation is the best time to deal with what I call the extremes. The second um, place where we see a lot of milk fever is, is often, it's not so much the diet and the specification itself, it's the fact that it's changing a lot. And what we see is different wintering systems. And so you have a quite a, a, a large change in some cases from dry cow diets to springer cow diets to colostrum diets to milking diets. And lots and lots of things are happening. And sometimes it's just the fact that there's just too much going on. And what we have is we've got the stress of that change. So cows don't like their, their feed changing and it will affect their intake and the level of cow comfort. Um, we've got a change in nutrient supply, which takes some time to adapt, which is this whole rumen adaptation story. So while the rumen bugs are quite fast at, at moving their population to adjust to a different feed, the full rumen papillae, you know, the things that do the absorbing of nutrients can take three to six weeks to really adapt to a new diet. So 
if we're doing a lot of changes, then the rumen just isn't able to function in the way that it should. And we, when it's not functioning in the way that it should, then we get a lot of acid and impaired absorption. So the, the acid just can't get out. And there was a study done, and that's what this picture is on the right-hand side. Apologies, it's not very clear. But they basically collect biopsies from the wall of the rumen and assess inflammation. And what we know now is there is a lot of inflammation that occurs at transitional carbon, largely due to these dietary changes. And so this is where Levisali seed live yeast, which I'll cover off a little bit later on. Um, we're seeing some really good benefits of including this in the Springer and transition diets just to help with these dietary changes that are happening. And, and what they found was that it really changed the gene expression of those genes involved in inflammation. So it can really help cows through that process um, when invariably the diet is, is going to um, vary a little bit. But I guess if we're looking at the management of of these sort of changes, if I take two examples, one sort of kind of opposite in some ways, but if you're a winter crop feeder, so say you're on an eight and four diet, again, this is just an example, and then you're coming back home and you're sort of on a pasture and hay diet, then ideally try and step these cows down off crop before they come home and increasing the baleage so that we get some, what I call smoothing the change. So some similarities uh, to try and make it not such a rapid change in diet between those two. Um, if you're going to keep some crop in the milking diet, so say they've come home, you've got some fodder beet at home that they come home to, that you've used to transition them on in the, in the front end, and now you've got some left at the back end, then rather than sort of taking it out, putting it in and taking it out, putting it in, keep a couple of kilos in the springer diet so that, again, we try and smooth that change. The other way that I'm seeing more and more farmers try and smooth this change is starting the transition diet or parts of the transition transition diet before they come home, particularly if cows are coming home, you know, 10 days or less prior to calving, then they really are benefiting from starting that transition or at the very least starting the magnesium um, for those cows before they come home. And, and I get that this can get challenging when you've got a whole range of calving dates, large herds, you know, it's it's not always easy, but I guess if you can just keep in the back of your mind smoothing that change, then you can go a long way to helping reduce some of these milk fever cases that you might be seeing. The other way that we can go is, um, you know, wintered on pasture, pasture and hay. And then we, we like to feed a bit of concentrate in the diet as milkers. And so all I'm suggesting there to smooth the change that way is to add a bit of concentrate into your Springer diet. And certainly that's where your Grain Corp team can help you out. They're really good at um, the, the recommendations to try and get that adaptation from a starch and a rumen perspective, um, but also to try and give the cow some time to develop the papillae and do all those sorts of things that she needs to do. So basically the blue little box is if you didn't want to listen to all the ramble, that's all you need to know. So you step them up or step them down, smooth the change is, is the key message there. Number three is stress, and it's probably something we do underestimate, but if we look at what happens, you know, for these dry cows and going to spring of cows, and, you know, there's a lot of mob reshuffling. And as you know, cows have quite an interesting social structure. It's uh, much more complex than I think we ever understand. And if we're always reshuffling mobs, they're always having to reshuffle their social hierarchies and, and that can cause a lot of stress. Fighting over resources if there's not enough access to feeds or break sizes are getting a bit tight. Um, we've got some heat stress for those of you who are autumn carving and, and that's another presentation on its own. There's some quite unique challenges relating to autumn carving and milk fever. Um, but you've got the environmental stresses of heat, but equally you have a, a cold spell. Those be done south with your frost and your snow. Um, you know, you have a period of cold weather and we have quite a lot of stress on cows and quite a big change in, in the nutrient requirements too as well. Um, they come back home if they've been away. There's new people, new infrastructure. We've got the diet changing and then usually we've got silages in our diets and they are a risk for moulds and mycotoxins and pathogens which are another type of stress for these cows so um, you know the you'll see them sorting their social structure out every time you change things around uh, which largely decreases intake so this is the biggest impact of stress is that uncomfortable cows won't eat and this becomes a real issue as far as nutrient supply goes for for preventing milk fever 
Um, you can end up with milk fever in the Springer mob, which is something that we, we do see often, and often that is relating to stress. Um, and then when they've got stress, they've got a whole lot of this hormone called cortisol, which is a stress hormone circulating through the blood, which produces immune function. And I'll come to immune function shortly, but it's pretty important. And so we've got energy going to immune function, which detracts from the other things that it could be it could be dealing with or could be helping. So again, perfect world. Ideally, we split calves and mobs by calving date for our dry cows rather than by you know lights and fats or, or whatever other way we might try and do it. But if we can try and keep them in calving date um, mobs, then what it means is that when you're drafting out your springer cows, um, or you're moving cows from springers, you know, in, in, from the dry cows to your springers, they're going kind of with the same group of cows that they've already met before. Rather than trying to take these cows from this mob and these cows from this mob and trying to shuffle them up again. Um, obviously, eventually they will meet everybody when they're all in the milking herd, but at that really critical springer cow time, if we can split the mobs by calving date as dry cows, it reduces the stress of that social change when they come into that springer mob. Um, ideally don't make too many feed changes if we can help it and try and just have this really nice calm low stress environment um, as far as people and handling goes. The fourth one is energy in the springer diet so this came out quite a few years ago well, I don't know now maybe five um, around the, the impact of having too much energy for springer cows and we do know that if we really overdo springer cows that they eat less post-calving in particular. And, and often it can cause some issues with milk fever because they start eating less prior to calving too, which means they're not eating the mag and all the things that you, you're doing to try and help her. Um, these cows that have too much energy will eat less. So try not to overdo it. And sometimes when we've got a lot of milk fever, we're trying to fix it. And, and sometimes what I do see is, is farm businesses trying to put more energy into the Springer diet. Um, but it's important that we, we don't go too far in that space. And equally, we don't underdo these springer cows. So, um, you know, if they don't have enough energy, they're going to not be able to calve very well. Now, this is practically very challenging when you've got particularly a crossbred herd, a huge range of live weights. Uh, how do you not underdo those big cows and overdo those little ones? So I get that this is this is quite challenging, but my my recommendation is basically to keep these cows physically full so using your fiber sources so that they feel like they're eating 18 kilos but we're not overdoing energy so lots and lots of fiber is probably the key to make sure those bigger cows can still get the intake that they need uh, but not um, too high that we we really overdo that energy but this is where your grain corp team and your new tech team can work with you with your plan for your springers and go, hey, look, you know, we've got a bit of a buffer in there in terms of energy, but we're not going, we're not going too high on that ME front. The same with protein, really. It's a little bit like a Goldilocks story all the way through, <laughs> too much and too little. So, you know, too much protein in the springer diet, which we can often see in those later calving springer cows because the pasture starts to get a bit more lush and leafy, uh, and we get a bit tired and our breaks start to get a bit bigger. Um, too much protein for springers can can cause cows to go down in the springer mob and the reason being is they start making colostrum milk early that protein gives a really nice signal to <laughs> to start making milk and so the demand comes on early and her body's not set up to deal with that so we try not to have too much protein in the springer diet but also we can't have too little because you know she's making colostrum she needs to make those antibodies the calf can struggle as well because the fetal demand for protein goes up uh, quite significantly at calving so the, the rule of thumb here is roughly 15% crude protein. So, you know, it doesn't need to be this 18 to 22 that we might do for our milkers, but equally I see a lot of Springer diets sitting around 11% crude protein and it, it probably is, is too low and is having quite a few flow on consequences. So, um, yeah, certainly again, talk to your Grain Corp and Nutritech teams. They can run what you're thinking for your Springer diet. We can see where your protein's sitting. Uh, so this is the biggie. This is uh, probably the one traditionally that you probably thought I was going to start with, but those cow management things are, are, are very important as well. But this is the crux of it is that what your cow has in its blood at any one time and quite tightly regulated is roughly three grams of calcium. So don't worry about the number. You'll, you'll see the, the importance of that shortly. 
but basically that calcium is so that she can do all the very important functions that we've talked about in terms of smooth muscle contraction but equally that calcium is a really important part of blood ph so she's quite tightly regulating calcium for both calcium but also for blood ph the problem is that we then have 10 liters of colostrum just as an example which has a demand of 23 grams of calcium. So again, you don't need to know the numbers. All you can see is that there's quite a big difference between three in the blood and 23 going out in the, in the, in the colostrum. So what we need to do is try and set up the cow to deal with this imbalance so that you don't have to go out there at one in the morning with a bag of metabolics and get her up. Um, equally, it, it saves a lot of work if you can, um, yeah, like I said, get the cow to sort this gap out herself. So one of the key ways that we do this, particularly in New Zealand pasture-based farming systems where um, you know, they haven't got 24-7 access to feed, we don't always have cows calving in barns, although we do have more calving in barns, so this is changing. But you know, we need the cow to be able to look after herself. And the key place that she can get that difference in calcium and phosphorus is from her bone store. So the whole point of our specific Springer diets is so that she can do this process herself so that you don't have to go out there and help her. Um, so the first thing that we can do, and I'll go through each of these individually, is have a low decad diet. Now there's a number of different strategies we can use for milk fever, but for the majority of um, diets that we work with, having a low decad diet is the one that really helps the cow to get the, the calcium and the phosphorus out of the bone. The other thing that we need to do is to make sure we have enough magnesium. So magnesium basically makes the tissue sensitive to the hormones that do this process on this blue arrow. So we need the mag and ideally a low decad diet. But critically and something we're learning more about is vitamin D. So vitamin D is what we call a pro-hormone. It's part of, again, this arrow, this process, but particularly important for getting phosphorus out of the bone. And a lot of you are coming to us uh, asking around, you know, cows presenting not with hypocalcemia or the classic down cow milk fever, but this creeper crawler cow, phosphorus deficient milk fever. And vitamin D is really critical for getting phosphorus out of the bone. It's got, it's got a quite a unique pathway. Um, and then we don't want to have too much calcium and phosphorus in our, um, in our diet on a DCAD type program, because otherwise there's no incentive for the calcium to come out of the bone. And when there's no incentive for the calcium to come out of the bone, then it's, it's really, really hard work come calving time. So if we look at DCAD, so it's a big fancy set of words, cation, anion difference. Basically, to make it simple, it's potassium. And where we have high potassium, we have high DCAD, and high DCAD blocks that calcium moving out of the bone. So as you all are probably aware, we've been told not to graze effluent paddocks. Why? It's the high K that causes those problems for springers. Um, really, really lush pastures, and again, if we're starting to get later into spring, um, then this can be an issue, or for your autumn carvers, if you get that autumn flush, this is where we often see things start to fall over. But any of you guys who, and girls who have high soil K or whey farms, or, you know, situations where you take a pasture feed test, and you see you've got high K, um, and when I say high K, anything over two, two and a half percent is probably going to start to cause you issues. I see it as high as, you know, four, four and a half percent in some cases. Um, then you're going to risk having, having issues with getting calcium out of the bone. The thing that we often miss is that uh, when we in silage make baleage or, or grass silage or any silage, um, the, we often forget where we've cut it from. And often we've cut it from quite... Um, productive and fertile paddocks because they're growing pretty fast, which can be high in K. That K does not disappear once it's gone into the bale. So sometimes we're feeding baleage because we think it's going to be less hot or less risky than our pasture, but often if we test it, we find it is, um, if not the same or more risky because that K is still in there depending on where we've cut that from. So often what we'll suggest is getting baleage, say from, um, you know, dry stock platforms or, or areas with lower areas of fertility and obviously doing a test so we know um, to check that we haven't still got high levels of K um, coming through from, from that baleage. And uh, all the nerdy nutritionists, we all get really excited because we, we get these programs and we calculate out what your DCAD is based on all the different feeds in your Springer diet. 
internationally, we'll try and get it below zero. Uh, New Zealand, I'm pretty happy if we can get it below 200, ideally around that 150 mark. So this is just the sort of numbers that we work with to try and help you reduce, reduce milk fever. But as far as milk fever causes go, this would be the number one cause of milk fever in New Zealand based on our pasture-based system and the levels of K that are in our diets. Um, don't worry about all the numbers. Basically, these numbers are all um, different studies. But in general, what it shows is if your decad is lower, then your milk fever risk is lower. Obviously, there's some variation, but it doesn't really matter which trial you look at. Generally, the lower decad, the, the lower the risk for milk fever. Uh, so the, the management here is really test your pastures and silages. Know, know what you're dealing with. And your Nutritech team are more than happy to help you out in the space and help you with the interpretation of those results. We can run it through what we call Diet Check. It's a um, program that we can import feed tests directly from Hill Laboratories straight into the program. And you tell us how many kilos of each you're planning on feeding. And we can help you work out you know, where your decad and where your risk is. Um, ideally, we try and reduce those green leafy high K feeds. Just a little note here that sometimes we try and reduce pasture, but you, you tell me you're putting oats in. And I've had oats tested around the country and often it's really, really high in K. So um, this is green feed oats or ensiled oats um, as oat baleage, just to be mindful that um, sometimes just because we're reducing pasture doesn't necessarily, we've, we've solved the problem and to always test those feeds, particularly if they're going to be more than three kilos of your, your spring cow diet. Um, often what we'll do is we'll increase those fibrous or low K feeds, so the hay, straw, maize, whole crop cereal silages. They're really useful in the Springer diet to help bring that K level down, but also dilute that protein down as well. And then what we'll do is we'll often suggest feeding anionic salts. So, for example, the Nutrium and Springer cow balancer or your grain corp transition palette, which I'll go through shortly, um, to try and counteract those K levels. So, there's really specific formulations and ingredients in there, really, really powerful to try and to try and counter that high K. Magnesium. So this is one we've always known. We've we've always, you know, you've done the old school dusting, or you know, we've got more sophisticated feed systems as well. But you know, it is one of those key ingredients, but it is one that we can often, you know, we're getting milk fever, we start to panic a little bit. Understandably, it's pretty stressful. And we keep throwing more mag and more mag and more mag in it. And sometimes um, too much mag can be the problem. Um, generally, you need more mag if you've got high crude protein in your diet. It affects the magnesium, um, I guess, solubility and the ability for or pH within the rumen, which therefore affects its ability to get through the wall. Um, but also you need sodium for magnesium to get through the wall and to be absorbed. So often when I'm seeing issues and, and magnesium's not, or magnesium might be sufficient, often I'll check sodium and, and sodium's low. So it is this balance and also high K will reduce your mag absorption. So if you're in the Springer diet that is quite high in lush leafy pasture with high group protein, high K, then likely I'll recommend more magnesium in that situation. Versus if you're in a barn, you've got zero grazing, You've got some whole crop cereal silage or some maize silage and some hay and straw, your mag requirements are a lot lower than what the outdoor um, Springer diet would be. So again, there's a little bit of um, interpretation required in, in this um, recommendation for magnesium, um, but certainly something we're happy to talk to you about for your specific situations. Vitamin D, so um, the risk is really on low pasture diet. So here's the problem, right? We reduce our pasture intake so that we reduce the K issues and reduce the protein issues and you're doing everything that I've told you to do previously, but then we create a vitamin D issue. So this is the, the art and the balance of Springer cow diet. So, um, you know, I sort of thought maybe we've got enough sunshine in certain parts of the country during winter, but upon further reading, basically if we're below 35 degrees south, which is anything below Cape Reinga, so the entire, pretty much the entire of New Zealand, we don't have enough um, sunlight basically, or UV, what they call UV attenuation, through winter um, with our lower winter daylight hours and um, just the angle of the sun, all that sort of stuff that I don't really understand. Um, there may not be enough vitamin D coming from sunlight. Um, equally, we often have poorer weather, um, you know, cloudy days and, and winter conditions. 
Um, we're also bringing cows indoors more now. So those, those particular diets really need vitamin D. And also if we've got low pasture, so again, those barn feed or we've got a lot more silage, vitamin D doesn't last in silage. So um, those sort of conditions really increase that vitamin D requirement and, and have been contributing to, um, again, those phosphorus deficient like milk fever, um, creeper cooler, milk fever cases, which can be more complex to treat. Uh, and take a lot longer to get those cows right again. But certainly I would be saying feed vitamin D to springer cows. It just takes all the risk out of it. And in some cases, you might need a lot more vitamin D depending on your feeding system. Uh, calcium and phosphorus. So uh, these are two really important ingredients. And again, it's that Goldilocks story, not too little, not too much. One of the things that we'll often check is you know, we can do everything right to set up these cows to mobilize from bone store. But if the bones are empty, then there's nothing there to help the cows out when she needs it at calving. So, you know, it's really important to make sure that late lactation, dry period, you know, have we had a period of time through the middle of lactation where we haven't been feeding any cow, um, lime flour? Um, you know, how can we make sure that we're not depleting the cow now in these critical periods? just because we're at the tail end of lactation. So it's one thing that we can help you help you go through. Too much of either calcium or phosphorus in the pre-carving diet can reduce that mobilization from bone store and absorption from the diet. So basically the more you have flowing through the intestine, um, the less she's going to pull into the system. Uh, and the other thing is that if she's got a lot of calcium and phosphorus in, in the blood, then she's not going to have those hormonal signals um, and metabolic signals to, to mobilise from bone store. Too little when obviously there's not enough to function and we get issues. So this is where our, our target ranges come in for calcium and phosphorus, which our fancy diet check program will calculate for us. Um, so again, check your lactate check your lactation and dry cow mineral balance so that's something you can do now and I'm not against feeding lime flour or DCP to springers I have done it um, but I would just say hey look let's only do it under nutrition advice because if we get this wrong and we get into what I call no man's land in terms of some of these calcium and phosphorus levels um, then we can have a whole lot of um, headaches happen. Number 11 so we're nearly through this so bear with me um, transition cows have reduced immune function and so what this picture here on the left says is you know at calving immune function drops basically and it can take a bit of time for it to come back uh, but the thing we're learning more about now is that low calcium makes immune function worse and when you look into why it is and I tried to find a pretty picture and all I got was really complex biochemistry pictures so I didn't put them in but um, basically they say that if you've got low blood calcium or hypocalcemia then you blunt the signals for immune cells so all that means is that your immune cells can't talk to each other so normally calcium is a really critical part in their communication as such um, and if we've got low blood calcium those immune cells can't talk very well and so you don't get a very good signal and therefore the animal doesn't get the immune response that it needs and they're more um, more liable to be getting you know cell count issues and metritis and mastitis and those types of things so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that trace elements they're only this little wee small things but look let's not deplete them now let's not deplete them through winter the demand through winter and the um, things that interfere with their absorption actually go up so have a little think about your wintering program and how you how you're managing your trace elements through winter um, but also not to forget your vitamins especially for your spring cows so your vitamin e and vitamin d in particular um, i would suggest supplementing um, trace elements and your vitamins for your spring cows as as you know as standard the last one is what we call primary antioxidants and what these are is your, your selenium and vitamin e largely do the mopping up you know when you've got cell damage and immune immune um, issues going on they do the mopping up but what the primary antioxidants do is stop that damage in the first place. So um, the Nutrimin Spring Cow Balancer product through Nutritech and available through Grain Corp as well contains what we call mellow feed, which I had no idea about before I started with Nutritech. And basically it's a source of primary antioxidants that stop this damage happening in the first place. So um, there's some really cool YouTube videos, which if anyone is interested, we can send through to you. But basically this is your traditional rock melon. 
which shows your, your typical aging as such. Um, but they found a special one and it basically, it didn't age, it didn't rot, it didn't decay. And it had, what they found it had was these primary antioxidants that stopped the damage to the cells of this rock melon. So as you can imagine, all of the um, pharmaceutical and um, skincare companies got very excited about this and you can buy it for yourself online as well. Um, but basically, there's this really powerful antioxidant that has taken um, the interest of a lot of nutritionists and people in cow health, but also monogastric cow, so particularly in pigs, um, because of the effects of this powerful antioxidant. So when we looked at that graph that showed immune function declining at calving, um, we thought it was a no-brainer that mellow feed should be in, in that spring of cow balancer for that reason, to try and help cows through. That, that really um, difficult transition period. So let's get into prevention strategies. What can we do about it? So number one, I would suggest is getting a diet check. You tell us what you're planning on, on feeding and doing for your spring cows. And we can help go through all of those things that I've just been through, your protein and your calcium and your phosphorus and your decad and your mag and check that all those numbers are where they should be. And then we can help you make recommendations to try and correct any def um, deficiencies, which are what these yellow boxes are, um, to say, hey, look, I think to help reduce your risk of milk fever, we need to do X, Y, and Z. So get your feeds tested and uh, get a diet check done would be my first recommendation. The second option that you have, uh, well, not option, the second um, thing that you can do to help prevent milk fever, and it's a really convenient all-in-one bag product, is this Nutrimin Spring Cow Balancer. So what this does is it goes through, again, that a lot of that list of things that contribute to milk fever and helps to correct those imbalances, vitamin D, vitamin E, a really nice trace element pack with organic trace, um, organic selenium, it's alka, alka cell selenium. Um, so in organic copper, for example, so some really nice um, trace elements, vitamins, but also a really powerful decad or anionic salt to counter that high K level that most of the Springer diets in New Zealand have. Um, there's also chromium for insulin sensitivity, a little bit of calcium in what we call a Springer safe form um, to give a little bit of calcium, uh, but not too much that we overdo things, um, and some mag magnesium as well. So a really nice all-in-one bag um, option that will often, if we put this into diet check, will we'll fix a lot of those imbalances in the diet. Um, we're seeing quite a big growth in the high mag space and so if you get the spring cow balancer through grain corporate and the grain corp transition palette which I'll go through soon um, we're typically using the high mag version um, just depends on your magnesium feeding system really but there's a high mag option there's also a remensin option as well which if we're trying to um, reduce the risk of ketosis post calving then you really do need your remensin in, in your Springer cow diet because that's where the greatest benefit comes from in terms of ketosis prevention. So um, if remensin is something you're interested in for your feed conversion efficiency and your milk production and your ketosis and your bloat and all those other things that we know about remensin, um, really good idea to try and include that in your Springer cow diet, as well as the live yeast that I discussed as well to help that rumen get through those challenges of uh, transition. So there's custom options as well. If you've got a really weird diet, then um, we, can, we can make something that's going to help meet your requirements. So just people often ask, how do I feed it? Well, really farmers are pretty creative. We come up with all sorts of ways to make it work. So literally just dusting it over your next break of feed. Um, some will just move this wire. So the picture on the left here, move the wire just up to the edge of your silage or your hay or whatever you've dusted it over just so they can eat underneath and not trample over it. Um, but you know that's a, a quite a basic way of, of feeding it out. Those of you with feed pads will, will dust it over top of your, um, your feed pad mix or if you've got mixer wagons then that's quite straightforward to check it into your Springer cow um, ration. So that's how people will often use the powder and it doesn't need to be complicated it's it's and it doesn't take too long either it's a, it's a quick dust over the feed um the other thing that we have new for 2022 is we've got it available as a loose lick so for those of you who um, dusting it over feed it's not going to work for then having it as a free choice um, loose lick is another option that you could talk to your nutri tech area manager about for this season quite handy for springers and especially if you've got 
relatively small mobs of springer is quite an easy way to get it into them. Um, and then the Springer Cow Balancer product is in the Grain Corp transition pallet. So we put it into that pallet and that makes it really, really easy because you've got a two kilo feed rate. You've got some starch adaptation happening as well, which we talked about. If you've got a bit of in-shed feed going in post-calving, then it helps to have some of the starch um, starting in the Springer diet. A nice EME, um, reasonable protein, but not too high. Um, and how we see farmers feed it just varies entirely on their system and what they can make work. So some will do it in trailers for their Springer cows. Some will run it out along fence line. Um, and some will have a second silo with a second line and actually use it um, to, I guess, lead feed and transition feed Springer cows and draft out cows that are calved and those types of things using um, using the in-shed feed system. But really, it's a, if you don't if you're not really a fan of the powder option, then the pellet option is a really good way to, to get good intake because it's quite a nice chunky pellet so they can pick it up and you can minimise some of that wastage. But um, yeah, certainly something to talk to your Grain Corp team about. So then you're going to ask me probably some of this return on investment stuff, so I thought I'd cover this off. So I've just done an example here in a herd of 500 cows and say you've told me that you've I've only treated 30 and lost two. Well, the losses based on milk production, and this is just milk production alone, are 106 grand. So this whole, I've only treated 30 and lost two story is actually a really big number. And that number is only the milk production. That's not, again, those flow on effects that I went through at the beginning of the presentation in terms of your cost of treatment and your labor and the metritis, mastitis, repro consequences. So that's a very, very conservative number. Now, of course, we've got lots of different options for prevention. So, you know, to try and give you what it is to prevent is, is a little bit challenging, but as a rough ballpark, and, and there will be some that options that are less than this, you're between one and three dollars a day per cow, per cow per day, depending on which product you choose, whether it's a transition pallet or whether it's a powder. Um, obviously, whether it's got remains that all every cell you see um, in it. So, you know, compared to this $106,000 worth of milk lost, you've got a really small, between seven and 21 grand for this 500 cow herd for a 14 day transition period. So when we look at that return on investment, just on the milk production alone, you're between five and 15 to one. So a, a fairly good return. And you haven't got, again, those flow on effects in mastitis, metritis, repro, labor costs, you know, the stress on people and animal welfare as well. Um, I think that makes that ROI a much better number, but um, you certainly have a chat to um, your team around which options would suit you best. And then we can help you calculate a return on investment um, based, on, based on those options specifically for your situation. But what I wanted to say is that look, this prevention cost is a much, much smaller cost uh, especially with the, the way it links to everything else in terms of animal health spend at that time um, than the cost of treatment. Just quickly on post-calving, so I've done a lot on the pre-calving stuff, but colostrums really need to be your priority mob. They, they need to eat quickly is, is largely what we're trying to get them to do. So, you know, giving them every opportunity to eat. Um, even if you're only milking your colostrums once a day, they should still be drafted twice a day so that they can go through into the next break and get that next lot of fresh feed. Um, and ideally, they don't leave the colostrum mob or a special mob uh, until they're eating well. There's no point putting them out with the big herd and walking a long way if, if they're not eating well. So, you know, the, the real, you know, obviously we've got the colostrum milk going into the colostrum vat or transition milk vat, as we should really be calling it. Um, but but it's ultimately about getting these colostrum cows to eat. Um, high energy concentrates, obviously Grain Corp team are the experts in this space, but those high energy concentrates are really important for, um, for cows post-calving. Um, they're not going to eat enough volume to get enough energy, so this is all about minimising body condition loss in those early stages. You've also got your starter drenches, like your jumpstart starter drench through Nutritec as well and bypass fats that can help reduce some of that body condition loss in those, in those early stages. So yeah, certainly treat those colostrums and those early lactation cows as, as the priority. So just bringing it all together, look, milk fever is costly. It's probably a bigger number than we've given it credit for in the past. Your prevention is significantly cheaper. 
Uh, but it's important that you look at your specific situation because, um, you know, the things that might be causing your milk fever are, are possibly not the same as your neighbours. So um, make sure that you get the support that you need to look at your specific situation and that it is preventable. So often I'll go to farms and, um, you know, they say this is a milk fever farm. Nothing has been able to fix it. And and milk fever is preventable. We, we can reduce um, the incidence of milk fever in, in farms. Um, so it's just around trying to work out again your specific situation and what's causing your milk fever. Uh, and ultimately, healthy transition, you've got better animal performance for the entire lactation. It's not just that time that she's down. So get in touch with your Grain Corp or Nutritech team and um, we can help you out if you need. There we go. Has anybody got any questions? I've got a quick question for you, Nadine. Yes. Um, given that we're, in a, we're seeing um, quite a lot of drier areas this, this year at this point in time, um, grass growth is a little bit down on what you would say is a normal season at the moment, for sure, for, across most farms. Um, where do you see, I guess, the length of grass that it needs to be called as stored grass? Is it a, an age thing, a length thing? Um, where, where are you seeing that for people to try and factor that into their diets going forward for that transitional period? So sorry, Glenn, when you're meaning stored grass, are you meaning like winter saved? Yes, yes. Given that we don't have a whole lot of length at the moment, yeah. there's a lot of, um, I guess, your average cover in a lot of farms being down for this time of the year significantly and a lot of people drying off earlier. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly acknowledge it as a challenge out there. And I think what it's going to mean just in a general term is that maybe our springer diets are going to be a little bit different to what they've been in the past. So, yeah, so certainly, you know, evaluating them is a good idea because it might not be the same as what we've done previously. But yeah, I think if you've got less pasture in your springer diet, in some ways it's helpful. If you've got lower pasture cover, um, it's helpful in that we're not going to have maybe the high risk of that high K, high crew protein um, situation. But when it does take off, then that's going to have this really lush flush stuff, which is going to present quite a lot more issues. So you might find the early part of carving, things are okay and you can manage it all right. You're using some silages and some haze and whatever else you've got up your sleeve to try and fill the rest of your springer diet and you might find it's lower risk actually in the early stages but it might become higher risk in the later stages once it does finally get that chance to grow and take up the nitrogen and, and k and do what it needs to do to bounce back again um, the hard part always of springers is holding them tight without destroying your paddocks so if you've got lower covers you might actually find that you've got to offer maybe a greater area um, to get the same sort of intake as you might have done previously uh, again, it's all a bit of a farm specific situation, but it's just trying to make sure that we know roughly what we're feeding and being really mindful of when that growth does come on, that that risk is going to go up. Thank, thank you, Nadine. Um, any other questions? There was one there I'll cover off very soon, but is there any other questions um, for Nadine? I'll, I'll take that silence as a, um, we've answered ours all pretty well so far. So um, thank you very much for attending. Um, the other question was that whether or not we're able to see this again later. Um, so yes, we definitely have this uh, whole presentation saved. It will be posted up on Grain Court's Facebook page um, and you will be able to see that along with some of the other ones that we've done in the past. So um, I guess from all of us here, I thank you very much for attending. I hope you got a lot out of it. Oh, hang on. We've got another couple of questions. Let's some questions. A couple of questions <laughs> going through. Okay, so uh, can I get you to answer that one quickly, if that's all right? So the question is, how long before and after a cow calves would you feed the transition pallet? Yeah, great question. So that really what we're doing with that transition pallet is pre-calving. So ideally they would move to whatever your lactating cow pallet or feed would be post-calving. Um, it's not like there's any harm in feeding it post-calving. It's just not designed for post-calving and you get better bang for your buck out of something else. So ideally, and it's a really good point, I didn't even raise it, is that that transition springer diet in the perfect world would be 21 days. But if we can get 10, 14 days on a springer diet, we're going to reduce a lot of the issues. So ideally aim for that 14 to 21. And obviously not every cow is going to carve exactly when we want it to. So it just gives you a bit of that leeway to help adapt them where we can. But ideally that transition pallet or the springer cow balancer or whichever your solution is, is a, is a two to three week program pre-carving. Okay, and thank you for that one. And then we'll do this one as well. Um, the reason for dusting magnesium only to springers and milkers to calcium. 
Um, I'm going to go with they mean um, Dusty Mag to Springers, oh. but not Dusty Calcium to Springers. I yeah. think that's what we mean. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it all comes down to that balance and that Springer diet. So if we were going to go and dust lime flour to our Springers, then the risk is that the cow is having lots and lots of calcium pre-carving and then she doesn't have the ability to mobilise from bone store when that demand really comes on at carving. So typically what we try to do is not have that calcium pre-carving. Um, it's also to do with blood pH as well, but largely it's so that we give them the mag so that they can get that hormonal process to get calcium out of the bone started, um, but not give them the calcium because that will block it coming out from bone store. After carving, she needs a lot of calcium. She's got a lot of milk going out the gate and she also needs her magnesium as well. So that's why post-carving we do both and pre-carving we just do the magnesium. And another one here for you as well. Um, what are the signs that I get to know that the colostrums are eating really well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't always measure what they're deciding to eat on a given day. Look, the best thing you can do is um, on the left-hand side of the cow, you've got the rumen. So what I, what I suggest you look for is what I call the hollow triangle. So the empty triangle is from the hip bone. You've got the short ribs and your first long rib. If there's a hollow triangle in there, then that colostrum cow is not eating very well or she hasn't eaten to her maximum potential that day. So um, it's kind of like the sight glass on a you know, fuel gauge as such on the cow is that left-hand side looking for empty triangles, then that, that cow to me would not be one that I'd be moving to the milking mob. Um, it's, it's a little bit obviously yeah tricky first thing in the morning, they will be more hollow. Um, but you know if you go back in the afternoon, and you can see you've got these cows with this nice rounded left-hand side, what we often say is an apple on the left and a pear on the right, if we're looking at a cow from, from the back end, um, to see that we've got this nice good room and fill going on. Um, those of you with um, cow collars and, and technologies, obviously your rumination activity is a really key indicator that you can use there as well to see are these cows ruminating, and if they're ruminating or chewing, then they're getting that, that rumen contraction going, which is a really good sign. Um, and they're also getting that intake level up. So we'll see that rumination activity drop at calving. And then you can see some cows will respond and recover much faster than others in that rumination activity. So those would be the two tools, I think, that you'd have up your sleeve for that, aside from um, having them in a small pen in a barn and actually calculating what you're feeding <laughs> and what's being disappeared. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's another, another one here, which... So it might be a little bit hard, not quite 100% sure what they're trying to mean here, but if we feed more than maize, what will happen to their body? Now, um, I'm not quite sure where that's meant to be. I don't know if you've got any idea on what the meaning I want, that I'm is. I'm thinking if it's what's the consequences of feeding more maize. Too maize, it's too much maize, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because, you know, like you say, Glenn, we, we are short on grass in a lot of places and we are starting to feed more of, you know, different feeds or foods we might have had on hand for later. Um, maize is really helpful in that it reduces your decad risk, reduces that K risk, reduces the protein risk, but it's really, really low in calcium, really, really low in phosphorus, really low in sodium, and really low in vitamin D. So you solve some of your problems of your typical Springer diet, but you create other ones. And this is probably where if you had quite a high level of maize or whole crop cereal silage in your Springer diet this year, for reasons of you know pasture being short, or that's just what you're going to be doing that yeah, really get us to check your diet because that might be one that we do a custom formulation for to try and lift some of those calcium, vitamin D, for example, levels. So rule of thumb is if it's a white or a yellow feed, so, you know, like a, a maize silage, a whole crop cereal silage, fodder beet bulbs, sugar beet, you know, whatever your situation is, it's likely that that's low in K, but also low in vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, salt, and mag. So those things will have to come up. Hopefully that was kind of the what we were after in that question. Um, um, but going on further, of course, if there are more questions after this, uh, and you've had the opportunity to watch it, whether or not it was live or or recorded, please contact us either on Facebook or direct in the 0800 number. Um, but yeah, other than that, once again, thank you very much, Nadine, for your time, and thank you everyone else for attending. So um, with that, I'll call uh, the webinar to a close. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for attending. Cheers.